once again, we're looking at Jesus' call to discipleship. We heard it last week in the Gospel of John, and this week we hear it in the Gospel of Mark. Now, the main difference between the two callings that we hear in these Gospels is that in Mark, the call to discipleship is prefaced by a short summary of the Gospel that Jesus taught. In fact, it's the only time in all the Gospels that we are specifically told this is what Jesus thought the Gospel was. So discipleship, according to the Gospel of Mark, flows from the reality of the Gospel. It's not human will or effort or resolve, but the good news about God. So what we're going to do this morning is is quite simply just look at Jesus' understanding of the Gospel. And then we're going to look at the type of discipleship that flows from the Gospel. And we're just going to make three observations about each each of those things. So the first is the good news according to Jesus. Three observations. First is that the gospel is a fact. Yes, the gospel is a person, Jesus of Nazareth, and it is also a fact, something that is happening in and around Jesus. Now, after John was arrested, we're told in verse 14, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. One of the interesting interesting things here is that the gospel does not begin with a state of human emotion like fear or guilt or shame. It doesn't begin with a private spiritual conversion experience or the wise teaching of a wise sage or an abstract um, call to some sort of moral living. No, the gospel begins as a fact. It's already underway, says Jesus. It's taking place in him and around him at this very moment. God is doing something right here and right now in this very person. The kingdom of God is at hand. Jesus tells us that it's a fact of history that has formative significance for the whole of history. There's two different words in Greek for time, chronos and kainos, and Jesus uses the word kainos, which means appointed time, a moment in time that has significance, profound shaping formative significance for the all of time. It's kind of what U.S. historians speak of when they speak of certain epochs in the nation's history as having formative significance for what comes afterwards, like the Civil War, the 1960s, or 9-11. But here Jesus speaks of the beginning of his public ministry, proclaiming the gospel. It's as if he's saying, you want to know the meaning of time? You want to know the most important and formative and significant event in world history? Well, here it is. The kingdom of God is at hand. This time of yours is now being filled with the presence of the reign of God. So that's the first observation. The gospel is a fact. It's a reality quite separate from our opinion. And the second is that the gospel is God, or another way of putting it is God is the gospel. The time is fulfilled, says Jesus. The kingdom of God is at hand. And he says this is the gospel of God, meaning that The kingdom is not first and foremost a human social agenda or human oath ethical imperative. It is about the being and the action and the presence of God himself. The kingdom is what God is doing and speaking at any given moment in time. And it's important for us to remember who this God is. This God is the God who is the creator and the upholder and the redeemer of all that is. Jesus is not talking about one segment of the human person as if the kingdom of God is in the human soul alone. Jesus is not talking about one sector of human society, the kingdom of God in the church alone. Jesus is not talking about one strand of world history, the kingdom of God in in Israel or America alone. Jesus is talking about the reign and the sovereignty and the rule and the good and gracious dominion of God over everything that is. God who is the origin and the meaning and the goal of the universe, of the whole of human history, and of the whole human person. 
heart, mind, soul, strength. So first we learn that the gospel is a fact. Then we learn that the gospel is about God and what he is doing and saying in our midst. And then, and only then, we learn that the gospel contains within itself the power to generate a particular type of human response. The gospel is a reality that generates a human response. Repent and believe, says Jesus. And those are two sides of the same coin. Repent being the kind of negative command and believe being the positive command. Repent, says Jesus, metanoia. Literally change your mind. Think differently about yourself, about God, about the world. Think differently about your neighbor and the purpose of life. You see, this word comes in a context where Jesus seems to assume that when we encounter him and his message about the kingdom, there will be some sort of clash of values, some sort of clash of priorities and worldviews, and we will become aware of the ways in which our lives are out of sync. The ways in which our attitudes and thoughts and actions and relationships and communities are out of sync, not the way they're supposed to be. And Jesus says, you're going to have to change the direction of your life. Repent. Do a U-turn. 180 degrees. Uh, the prophet Jeremiah in our reading this morning uses the language of removal to describe repentance. God's people are to remove the idols from their lives and the sin from their hearts. So this really practical, practical kind of pastoral question arises for me. Like what in my life, what in your life do you need to remove in order to be fully aligned, to be more fully aligned with Jesus and his kingdom? I wonder if that's a good question for us in this season. What in my life, what in our life together do we need to remove in order to be more fully aligned with Jesus and his kingdom? But for Jesus, repentance is never the end game. It's always on the way to belief. It's an act of belief itself. It's an act of trust that we can rest our whole life on Jesus and we can rest our whole life on the fact that he is bringing his kingdom into the world. We can trust this reality. We can place all our weight on it. We can bet all our chips on it. We can go all in on this fact. Repent and believe, says Jesus. Remove and return. Turn and trust. And it's really important that we keep the dynamics of repentance and belief always together and never separated. Because re repentance without belief leads to like frustrating legalism and oppressive moralism. But belief without repentance leads to surface level transformation and really compromised mission. And so this we discover is the good news of Jesus Christ for us this morning. The gospel is a fact quite apart from human opinion and effort. The gospel is about God, what he is doing and saying in our midst in this moment. And the gospel has the power to generate a human response of repentance and belief. And so the question I want to ask now is, what does discipleship look like in the wake of this gospel, in the wake of this good news according to Jesus Christ? And again, three observations. First, in discipleship, you simply never get past the gospel. <laughs> to be a disciple is to constantly be beginning afresh at the beginning. We're told that Jesus first proclaims his gospel in Galilee, and that's a little geographical reference that has some significance later in the gospel. The disciples are called to follow Jesus right in Mark chapter 1, and then they are to identify with the disciples. We are to identify with the disciples and follow Jesus throughout his public ministry and death, culminating in the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. And then the interesting thing is that at the end of the gospel in Mark chapter 16, it ends with the angel of the Lord saying to the disciples, Jesus is not here at the tomb. He has risen indeed. 
go to Galilee, note the geographical reference, you will find him there. He is gone before you and will be waiting for you. Now for the reader, what this does is that this encourages us to go back to the beginning of the gospel, which is starting with Jesus in Galilee, and to begin again from the beginning and follow the whole course of Jesus' life. And so I think one of the points that Mark is trying to make to us all the way at the end of the gospel is that how do you follow the risen Jesus? By going back to chapter 1. And once again, attending to the details of his earthly life and ministry. And I find this to be really practical and really encouraging. Like no matter how seasoned you are as a disciple of Jesus, and we've got a lot of seasoned disciples in our church, you never get past the reality of the gospel. You never grow out of the simple truth of the gospel. Because growth in the Christian life is simply growing ever more in seeing that the gospel is true. It is reality. And I think this is wisdom for, for those times in our Christian journey where we feel stuck. I mean, I don't know about some of you, but there have been moments over the last year where I felt stuck. Maybe some of you feel like following Jesus was once so exciting and joyful, but now you find yourself apathetic or cynical or losing heart or not knowing what to do. So what do we do? We begin afresh at the beginning. Mark chapter 1, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The kingdom of God is at hand. Let it fill your sails. So we learn first that in discipleship, we never get past the gospel. And second, we learn that in discipleship, there can be no separation between believing the gospel and following Jesus, between faith and obedience. I think this is why the call to discipleship that comes in verses 16 and following, <coughs> excuse me, comes directly on the heels of Jesus' proclamation of the gospel. In Jesus' view, the two come together although in an irreversible sequence. To hear the gospel correctly is to discern within it a call to a decisive decision to follow Jesus. It seems that Mark wants us to see that God has made a total claim on us in Jesus. In Christ, we belong to God, and now we have to make this clean and swift break with our old way of life, and we have to prioritize Jesus in his kingdom above all other realities. We see this dramatically displayed in the verses that follow. Jesus searches for Simon and Andrew and for James and John. They're just going about their daily jobs. And he interrupts them and calls them to follow him. And then we're given details that are very rare in the Gospels. Verse 18, and immediately they left their nets and followed him. And then verse 20, and immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants, and they followed him. These details are important. The nets represent their work, their trade, their craft, their livelihood. And the father represents the closest of family ties and the deepest of family loyalties. Now, this is not negligence. I mean, there are hired servants there still to help the father with the job. But the point is clear in the gospel. It's not that everyone needs to leave their job and leave their family to follow Jesus. But it is that following Jesus ought to become the definitive and defining loyalty of our life. And then family and work and everything else revolves around that loyalty. I remember when I was in Canada meeting uh, a young grad student in theoretical physics, of all things, who was from Mauritius. And this, uh, this was a stumbling block for him, this call of Jesus and this commitment to loyalty, especially as it related to the family. I remember meeting with him. There was a series of months where we met together once a week to have coffee and, and read a chapter from the Gospel of Luke. He had never heard of Jesus before, so I thought I'd introduce him. And he, he was really drawn to Jesus. He loved so much of what Jesus was on about, but he continued to stumble over Jesus' teaching about family. And I found this so interesting. 
because he grew up in a Hindu family, I came to find out. And he realized that to follow Jesus would mean that he would be rejected by his family. And so Jesus called to discipleship raised for him a very practical and deep question about where does his deepest loyalty lie, to Jesus or to his family? And this is a question that comes to all of us in different ways, in different places, in different times in our life. I think this is part of Paul's point in 1 Corinthians 7. Whether you have children or not, whether you are married or single, whether you are a Jew or a Gentile, whether you are an employee or an employer, you, Paul says, are called by Christ to walk with him in whatever circumstances you find yourself. You are invited to be completely and totally and utterly devoted to him and his kingdom. So we discover that in discipleship, we can never get past the gospel. And in discipleship, there can be no separation between this believing and this following, this faith and this loyal obedience. And finally, in discipleship, we discover that you will become the sort of person who lives for the sake of others. Uh, Jesus chooses us. Jesus finds us. Jesus calls us. But it's so that we may be the means through which he does that for others. Verse 17, follow me, says Jesus, and I will make you become fishers of people. Note the second statement is not another command. It's a promise of Jesus. I will make you become. This is something Jesus will do in us. We're just to focus on following Jesus. That is our calling. That is our vocation. That is our gift. That is our joy. And as we focus on following Jesus, Jesus will do this work in us. He will make us the sort of people that share his others-oriented heart. It's for God so loved the world that he gave his only beloved son. And this image of fishermen or fisherwoman echoes language from the prophet Jeremiah, chapter 16, verse 16. The images of Israel scattered in foreign nations, plagued by economic scarcity and idolatry and fear and even pandemic, interestingly enough. And God reminds his people that he delivered them from Egypt once and he's going to do it again. And then the image of fishermen shows up. God says, I'm going to send fishermen, and they are going to catch you, my people, from the nations and bring you back to me in this land. And there is going to be new creation in the presence and the kingdom of God. So the prayer for us is, Lord, in a season where so many feel isolated and disconnected and scattered, who do you want me to invite in? Who do you want me to welcome in? Who do you want me to seek and to find and to include and to cherish? See, like God's election of Abraham and Israel, so it is with followers of Jesus. I will bless you so that through you, all peoples and all nations in all places will be blessed. My brothers and sisters, this is the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is the call to discipleship. This is the joy of the Lord. And he who calls you to this, he's faithful. He will surely do what he says. And that is why after this message, we are going to sing a hymn of praise together. It's called the Te Deum. It's a hymn that dates all the way back to the 5th or 6th century that the church has been singing for some 15 centuries of praising God for his goodness and his grace, recognizing the joy of getting to respond to the gospel of Jesus Christ. So my brothers and sisters, would you join with us as we sing this hymn of praise together? In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.